Psalm 97. Psalm 97. For you, Lord, are the most high over all the earth. You are exalted far above all gods. Let those who love the Lord hate evil. For he guards the lives of his faithful ones and delivers them from the hand of the wicked. Uh, I, I love this passage because right in the middle of glorifying God, right in the middle of worshiping uh, the Lord for who he is as God, uh, David has some very practical fatherly advice for us, uh, for those who love the Lord. And it's uh, very, very simple, two words, hate evil. Say them with me, hate evil. Pretty simple, pretty simple. Uh, and uh, I don't think it gets much more cut and dried than that, that if you love the Lord, you hate evil. And, uh, but the reason David puts this command here is the fact that there are other ways that we who love the Lord sometimes respond to evil other than hate it. Uh, and the word evil uh, is the same word as sin. Sin is evil. Amen? Is sin evil or what? Yeah, it is. It, it is. And so hate sin, hate evil is uh, synonymous. Uh, ways other than hating it uh, sometimes come in, and I'd like to illustrate that this morning by something I'm calling the parable of the cow pie. The parable of the cow pie. Now, we're not going to get to the parable just yet. We'll get there in a minute, but I want to set it up uh, because we live in a culture that makes judging uh, one of the highest forms of evil in the world. Boy, if you judge anything, you are just who do you think you are, right? You know what I'm talking about? We, we, you don't judge. You don't know me. You have no right to judge me, blah, blah, blah. And, and while that's true, God's people are never to be judgmental people. We're not judgmental people. Uh, but sometimes out of our fear of being judgmental, we forget we forget that we are called to be discerning. And in the process, in our culture, as I look at our culture today, our culture has forgotten how to discern good from evil. It doesn't know anymore what the difference is. And in fact, in many cases, it calls good evil and evil good. That's the world that we live in. And part of it is because of this spirit that has come into our into our society of, well, you know, there's no, don't be judgmental, you know, what works for you is fine, it doesn't work for me, it's okay. And, and it's uh, confusing. Paul said very clearly in 1 Corinthians 2, 14 and 15, the person without the Spirit, in other words, someone who doesn't know Jesus, does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, but considers them foolishness and cannot understand them because they are discerned only through the Holy Spirit. The person with the Spirit makes judgments about all things, but such a person is not subject to merely human judgments. In other words, we can discern, we can see it, but we're not subject to being judged uh, according to human standards. You are an alien. Amen? Turn to the person next and say, you alien. You know, the, 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 the molds and models of the world don't fit uh, with us. We are not citizens of this place. The phrase, merely human judgments, that Paul uses here is the idea of making judgments about a person based on what we see on the outside, uh, based just on appearances, uh, without really knowing what's going on on the inside. And what comes out of that, the, the merely human uh, 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 judgments, what comes out of it is something that's just pervasive in our culture, prejudice and racism and uh, judgmentalism and Phariseeism in the churches. And it all stems from this idea of merely human judgments, just seeing something and making a judgment about what we think we see. But as people of the Spirit, we are and we do have a responsibility to go beyond the surface. And God gives us the ability to go beyond the surface and discern what's going on. Amen? 
to discern someone's heart, to discern an action that we're seeing, to look beyond the outward appearance. And this is what God does all the time. He looks beyond the outward appearance, and he makes his judgments on the heart. Amen? Not on the outside. And that's what's so amazing about God. And the Lord has given us that same ability as people of the Spirit to be able to have discernment in our lives. And we need to practice that, and we need to learn it. And... uh, especially when it comes to evil. And that's why David says very clearly, and there's other places too that I could go to, we need to hate evil. Oh, we shouldn't hate. Yeah, you do. You hate evil. You hate sin. You hate sin. You hate darkness. Is that okay? It's, it's, it's not politically correct, but it's right. Uh, you look, at, look at it this way, and I might say this again later on when we come to the cow pie, but Here's how you hate evil or sin. You hate sin the way a mother hates the cancer that's killing her child. That's how you hate sin. That, that's the, that's the, the stance you take when it comes to evil in our lives, personally and in the lives of other people. We don't hate the person, we hate the evil that is dissolving them and destroying them. And uh, so the Lord tells us, hate evil if you love God. I want to give you a couple of examples of other ways that believers respond to evil or respond to sin other than, other than hating it. Just, and again, I'm setting up for this parable of a cow pie that we'll get to, but here's a young man and loves the Lord and has a great family and, and uh, wife and kids. And in fact, he's a deacon in his church. By the way, these two illustrations are not here at Riverside, They're, but they, they illustrate very real uh, and very common situations in, not, in every church in, in the body of Christ. I'm talking about Christians and how they see evil or how they see sin. Uh, in fact, when you see this young man, you, you just say, boy, there's that... that that's what a Christian man looks like. That's, boy, that's the kind of man who really loves God and, and just, boy, he's got it. Uh, but he's got a problem. And really, there's only one other person that knows about the problem. Um, one of the secretaries at, 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 the work, at work, he just can't get his mind off of her. And, man, he's had lustful thoughts about her. He's dreamt about her. Um, And what's made it more difficult is that she knows that that's how he feels about her, and and she feels the same way about him. And those are the only two people that know about it, but they return each other's feelings. They flirt with each other. They they do things that kind of go beyond... um, both of them are married, both of them have kids, uh, and both know that what they're feeling and what they're doing is wrong, and that if they continue down this path, it's, it's going to turn into adultery, it's going to turn into something bad. And they've decided they're not going to go any further, but there's still that hanging over both of them. And... Uh, Even the thought of it. It's wrong, but he says in his heart, I can't help what I feel. I can't help what I feel. Um, And what keeps him from going any further in this relationship, what keeps him are basically three things. And listen to the three things that keep him from doing anything about what he would like to do. Number one, it would hurt his reputation at church. I mean, he's a deacon. Imagine what the church people would think. Number two, uh, he'd lose his job because that's just a no-no in his company. Um, And the third thing that keeps him from going any further is how could he explain it to his kids? Those are the three things. Uh, and so he keeps his fantasies, fantasies to himself, and she does the same, at least so far. Anything wrong with those reasons not to go any further? 
Here's one more before we get to the parable of the cow pie. Young lady, and she's on the worship team in her church. And she loves God with all of her heart. I mean, she's the one on, on Sundays when she's leading worship, she is crying and she's spinning and dancing. I mean, she's into it. She's a worship leader. And she works at a coffee shop um, in town. And one day she comes into the pastor's office and she's crying and she says, I, Pastor, I just don't know if I, I can believe in God anymore. She's a worship leader. And pastor says, whoa, that, that's a big jump. You're a worship leader, but now you're not sure you believe in God. What's going on? What, what, what's, why? Why the big leap? And she says, well, I steal from the till. I, you know, it's not much. It's not a lot. It's, you know, like five bucks, ten bucks a day. It's, and it's easy to, you can, you know, people lose that much just with tips and stuff. And so it's, it's easy to cover up, but... She said, you know, I, I, it's not like I'm shoplifting or anything. It's not bad. It's just, I, I just don't like that I do it. And I don't want to do it anymore And I feel because I feel awful inside. And I feel awful every time I do it. And it's starting to affect my music. It's starting to make it so that I don't feel like I used to feel when I'm up leading worship anymore, and, I, and, and I've prayed, and I've asked God to take this away from me, and he won't do it. I, I've asked God to take away the temptation, and, and he won't take the temptation away. And so I'm starting to feel like God doesn't care about me, and I'm, I don't know if I believe in God anymore, or he would do something about this. Any wrong, anything wrong with that reasoning? Anything wrong with that mindset? And yet, that is so common, beloved. That, that, that's so where our culture is at, and even it's so where our Christian culture is at today. Because we don't know how to discern evil. And worse than that, we don't know, we don't hate sin the way God hates sin. God hates sin so much that when Jesus became sin on the cross for you, God had to turn his back on his own son. And he cried out, Father, why have you forsaken me? And it's because God hates sin. And we, we don't. And so, where do we go with that? What's wrong? Born-again believers, active in their churches, love the Lord... No one in this room would call them wicked people. And, and, and in fact, we'd say, well, they're struggling with something. And you say, yeah, everybody struggles with something. Um, and I guess that's my point. The question is, is that just simply our lot in life? Is that as far as the gospel gets us? Um, get saved, go to church, and then just from there on, do the best you can. <laughs> And if you screw up, you know, God's loving and God's, you know, forgiving and God's wonderful and just, just it'll be okay. Don't worry about it. Um, as I reflect on the stories of these two fictitious people, um, I can count about 10 or 11 blatant sins in these situations. And what, by blatant, I mean... I can go to a Bible verse that tells us what that sin is very clearly. Not, I don't have to do any uh, exegetical uh, gymnastics with it. I don't have to twist it. I don't have to look at the Greek. It's just there. It's just sin. This is sin. Bah. I can do about 10 or 11 times with these two situations. I'm not going to take time to do that because that's not the point of my story this morning. The point is I want to take it to the deeper issue of what these stories represent. The way that they see their sin and the lack of discernment in the light of God's very clear word to us that if you love the Lord, and it doesn't matter how old you are, you don't come into this age of 
where everything's okay. It, it's just, if you love the Lord, hate sin. Hate evil. It's really quiet in here. <laughs> and, you know, nobody, no preacher likes to preach about sin. We all want to talk about heaven and angels and all that. But this is, this is where the rubber meets the road for so many of us, you know, as, as God's people. And we have to talk about it because God wants us to be discerning people. And so what I want to try to do, um, just to make it in a culture where black and white are now shades of gray, and where evil is good and good is evil, and even cultural Christianity where people excuse their sinful behavior by saying things like, and this has happened in my office, and it just grieves me when it does, They'll say, Pastor, I know technically this is a sin, but <laughs> I'm different. My situation is, di- I, know tech- I know the Bible says this, but you don't understand what I'm going through. You don't understand my situation. You don't under- you know, fine. But it, what it says is, no, you're not discerning and you're not hating evil. And that's why you're in the struggle that you're in because it isn't repulsive to you and um, I think God's people have got to come to a place where our ability to discern light from darkness is paramount because our culture is getting more and more deceptive I I have a message rolling around in my spirit I don't know when I'm going to preach it on the man of sin and what's coming uh and this is, this, is, this is the seed of it. This is, this is what's going on. But I think God's people have to come to a place where we discern light and darkness and we see sin the way God sees sin. And God sees sin through the eyes of hate. God sees sin through the eyes of judgment. God sees sin through the eyes of wrath because that's what he poured out on the cross. Hallelujah. He doesn't hate you. He loves you. He demonstrated that to you on the cross. But when he looks at our sin, what he sees is something that he hates. And he wants to destroy it because it's killing you. Hallelujah. And that's the way I feel about my daughter got taken to the hospital last night with an attack of pancreatitis. I hate pancreatitis. I hate it. It's killing my daughter. I hate it. And we've got to see sin the same way, beloved. doesn't matter what kind. And that's why David says, if you love the Lord, there's only one response to evil, and that's hate it. That's hate it. Now, I want to try to help us with this by a little parable that I've come up with called the parable of the cow pie. And ladies, I want to start with you. Ready? It always starts with the ladies. You know why? Because they're tougher. Guys are so wimpy, they fall apart. But, but, the, but the girls, no. Uh, you come home from a long day's work, and you're tired, and you unlock the door, and you open the door, and what hits you in the nose is this incredible stench. I mean stink. I mean gross. And you don't know what's happened. You drop your car keys and your purse on the floor, and you are just hit with this stink in your house. And you walk in, and there in the living room, you, know, you don't have any idea, you don't know how it happened, but somehow a cow got in your house, got in the living room where you just put down nice new white carpet. And this is no ordinary cow. This was a cow that was really up on its fiber. I mean, it was really, really regular. And right in the middle of your brand new white carpet that you just had installed is the biggest, ugliest, greenest, stinkiest, gushiest, splatteriest, grossest, cow pie you have ever seen in your life. I mean, it 
reeks, and it's splat. It didn't just plop on the floor. It plopped on the house. I mean, it, it's like a bomb went off, and there's cow poop on your walls and cow poop all over your carpet, and it reeks. It stinks so bad. And I don't know where the cow went. That I couldn't figure out how to do that in my parable, but we'll just assume that the cow somehow got out before you got home and locked the door. And, uh, but it, it, it stinks so bad that the flies are holding their nose as they're crawling all around in it, you know, as flies will do. And now let me just stop right here in the, in the parable. I want to stop because I, I, I want to make sure. Jesus did this when he told parables. Sometimes he would stop and explain symbology just in case we miss the picture. So I want to do that. Um, uh, just so there's no misunderstanding, I'll give you the interpretation of the parabolic imagery. Okay? You ready? It's theology. You got to do that. The woman is you. Okay? The woman is you. And the cow pie is sin. The cow poop is sin. And the house, the living room, is your life. Okay, everybody clear? That's the symbology here. Pretty deep, isn't it? You have a deep pastor, I'll tell you. He's just deep. Doesn't matter how it got there, it's not time to blame the cow. Who let the cow? Where'd that cow come from? And that's what a lot of people do. They want to go find the cow. Who cares? You've got poop all over your house. You know, so it's not about the cow. It's time to deal with the sin. We good? We understand the symbology? Okay. You guys are theologians. That's good. And you, being a woman of superior intellect, you pick the right way to respond. Um, you scream. <laughs> you freak out. You call 911, you call the Culligan man, you call the DIY network, you call Coit, you get on the internet and find out how do I get cow poop out of a white carpet, you know, and Google it, and, and you just go crazy trying to figure out what you're going to, you get brushes and you get mops and you get shovels and you get cleaners and, and pitchforks and you start scrubbing and, and you're going to keep cleaning on that carpet until you die to get it out of your house and get that stink out and get all that green junk out of your house and get rid of it. You want it out, and you want it out now, and you're going to do everything that you need to do in order to get that cow pie out of your house. How many are tracking with me? Do I need to explain that symbology? No, I think we get that. Yeah, we, we know what we're talking about here. You want it out forever. Who wouldn't? Who wouldn't? And you being an intelligent woman, that's, how you, that's what you do. And, and, and can I just say, that's a perfectly biblical reaction to sin. That's a re beautiful reaction to sin. You are doing exactly what David had in mind when he said, you love the Lord, hate sin. This is what he meant. Be repulsed by it. Get mad at it. Hate it. Get rid of it. Be ruthless about getting it out of your life, no matter what it takes. No matter what you need to do, Get it out. Root it out. That's a perfectly biblical response to sin. Hallelujah. And we can put fancy words on it. We can use the word take authority. If you need to take authority over a cow pie, go ahead and take authority over it. But just know that that cow pie has already had its authority, been taken authority over. You just got to get rid of it. It doesn't belong to you. Got to get it out. But the parable goes on, and the husband comes in, uh, walks in the door, and his response to this is a little different. He walks in and, honey, what's for dinner? <laughs> That's his first response. Because it doesn't kind of smell like tater tot casserole or something else in the room. And he sees you, and he sees the mess, and he looks at it, and he says, cow pie, hmm? Yeah, you know, when I was growing up, we had cow pies all over the living room, too. And my folks, they, they just got smart about it. They'd take rugs and just cover it over and just put a rug on it because what happens with them, honey, you need to understand this because I grew up on a farm and I can tell you, uh, just put a rug over it and then it'll dry up and it won't smell so bad. So just, just let's get a rug and let's just cover over 
the cow pie, and, and it'll, it'll dry up, and it'll, it, you know, it, it'll, you'll get used to it after a while. It's just something that happens. Sound familiar? Do I need to interpret that one? No, you don't need to interpret About that time, your teenage son walks in and sees the mess and says, Whoa, Mom, awesome! <laughs> oh, it's about time! I go to all my friends' house, they've got cow pies all over the house, and I'm not allowed to have one, and I'm embarrassed. But now we've got a nice cow pie in our living room. This is awesome. Now I can invite my friends home. Because we've got one too, just like them. This is cool. I've always felt left out, and now I feel like I'm just like everybody else. Thank you, Mom and Dad. What a gift. Maybe not so discerning, right? Do I need to interpret that one? No, I don't think so. Now, right on his heels comes your daughter. And this is the daughter who has always been in your family, shall we say, a little special. You know what I mean? Well, you will in a minute. Uh, she sees the mess, and she gets one of these grins on her face that she gets just before she does something weird. And she grins as she sees the cow pie all over the floor, and she, she, says, uh, she says, wow, <laughs> I know this stuff is gross, Mom, and I know it stinks, and I know it's awful, and I know it's putrid, but before you get rid of it, Mom, could I just, you know, could I just walk in it barefooted? I don't know. It just feels so good squishing between your toes, Mom. It's awesome. And it just feels so good. In fact, can we just keep it around? For, we can get rid of it when it dries, but right now is the best time. It just feels so good. Let me just walk around in it for a while. We'll get rid of it later. I understand. It's gross, and we need to get rid of it, and you just put your nice carpet down. But just, can we just hang on to it for a little while? Because it, it feels good. Try it, Mom. Try it. Now, I know that parable sounds really ridiculous. But too often, this is exactly the kind of reactions that many believers have towards sin. We, I know it's wrong. But I'll just cover it up, and eventually the smell will go away, and no one will notice. Or... Uh, I know it's sin, but after all, in fact, I had a young woman say, not here, another church, but I'm going to use this date. I know it's sin, but come on, it's 2016. You know what I'm saying? Come on, we don't worry about that stuff anymore. That's old-fashioned. That, I know it's sin. We need to lighten up around here. It's 2016, as if sin evolves over time. What was sin in the 1960s is not sin in the 1970s. By the time you get to 2016, oh, come on, are you kidding me? We're just, we've evolved. It's not sin anymore. People just aren't the same about these things. Or, I, I know it's wrong, but I can't help it. <laughs> I love it. It feels so good. And it's God's fault. Because God could make it so it doesn't feel so good. God could make me feel bad about it, but he doesn't. And so, blame the cow. Blame God. Blame the environment. Blame the president of the United... Blame somebody, you know. Uh, it just feels so good. And if he doesn't take the feel good away, then what can I do about it? But God sees sin as evil. And God sees sin as something to be despised and hated and judged and resisted and fled from and wiped ruthlessly out of our lives. And it doesn't matter what it is. And I'm not here to tell you what's sin and what's not sin. God will. If you open your heart to him, he'll show you exactly what he is. Someone said God hates sin. I mentioned this earlier, that's killing his children the way a mother hates the cancer that's killing her children. And I think that needs to be an important picture in our mind to get. The word of the Lord for us 
is very simple. If you love the Lord, you need to hate sin. It's okay. It, you need to hate evil. Um, listen, to, listen to some of the passages on this, and, and I could, there are dozens of them, but just listen to these strong words. Psalm 119, 104, I gain understanding from your precepts or your word. Therefore, I hate every wrong path. That's so politically incorrect, but this is where we're at. Psalm 119, 163, I hate and detest falsehood, but I love your word. Wow. Proverbs chapter 6, 16 to 19 says, there are six things that the Lord hates. Wait a minute, God's, God's love. How can he hate? Here's some things he hates. Seven that are detestable to him. These are such strong words. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked schemes, feet that are quick to rush into evil. The, the, the girl who wants to put her toes in the cow pie, God hates it. A false witness who pours out lies and a person who stirs up conflict in the community. Those are seven things that God hates. Wow. Boy, God sure is judgmental. No, he's God. And he gets to call the rules, amen? He gets to call the rules. He gets to say what's right and what's wrong. Nobody else does. He does. And then our job is to say, God, if you see this as evil, I see this as evil because I want to love your word. I love you, therefore I love your word. And what the word says is sin or evil, I say is sin or evil, and I respond to it just like a cow pie on my, on my carpet. Hallelujah. That's what I do. Proverbs 8, 13. The fear of the Lord. Many, many passages on the fear of the Lord. The beginning of, the, beginning of wisdom. Many, many, many. The fear of the Lord, Proverbs 8, 13, is to hate evil. To hate evil. I hate pride and arrogance, evil behavior and perverse speech, the Lord says. Wow. So in this politically correct culture that we live in, it's really hard to preach a message on sin. But God hates it. God hates it. And he hates it because he loves you. He hates it because it destroys the design that he had for you before you were in your mother's womb. He hates sin because it is destroying everything that he created you for and to be. You're here for a reason. Hallelujah. Every one of us. We're all here for a reason. And he hates sin because it messes you all up. And he loves you too much for that. The thing that hurts the heart of the Lord more than anything, more than the devil himself, the devil's already made his bed. What God hates even more than Satan is to watch what happens in the lives of his children when we don't hate sin enough to get rid of it. God hates that more than he hates Satan because that's already a done deal. But what he really hates is the sin that destroys his children. Hallelujah. I love you guys and I'll always tell you the truth. Even when it stinks. <laughs> Even when it smells like a cow pie. We got to know what the cow pies are. Let's stand together. And this morning... It's time to get the cow pie off the carpet. It's time to get it out of your life. And, and here's, here's how I want to approach this. If, if you've been asking for forgiveness for the same thing over and over and over again, you, it, you, 
you ask forgiveness, you, you feel great, and you go out and do it again. You go out and have that in your heart again. It happens again, and you ask forgiveness again. This cycle of asking forgiveness, but nothing changing. Um, then the word of the Lord to you is stop asking. Stop asking. Stop. Don't do it. I, I'm not going to ask you to come and ask forgiveness this morning. That sounds weird. But what I want you to do instead, what the Lord wants us to do instead, is to humble yourself before the Lord here in his presence and say, Lord, I realize today I constantly fall back into this sin because truth be known, I don't hate it. I don't hate it. I know it's wrong. I, I, I know it is. I know it's hindering my walk. I, I know everything. I, I can quote it to you, but I don't really hate it. Not like you do. Not enough to repulse me. Not enough to get, to give, to, to get it out of my life. And so instead of asking forgiveness one more time, I'm going to open my heart to your Holy Spirit and allow the conviction to come and stay there until I get out the brooms and the mops and the shovels and the pitchforks and get it out. And I know God will help me. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. You're not in this alone. You don't have to figure it out yourself. God will empower you and set you free from sin if you'll respond to conviction, not to forgiveness. Lord, there's a cow pie in my living room. And I need a holy indignation to rise up inside of me that says, enough, enough. No more games, no more covering it up, hoping it'll go away. Let a holy rage start burning inside of me until this thing is dealt with forever. A rage that leads to godly sorrow and godly sorrow that leads to true repentance and true repentance that leads to deliverance and deliverance that leads to freedom. So I'm not asking forgiveness for this stuff anymore because I hate it. And beloved, that's what God is here to do. You don't have to tell me what it is. I'm not here to embarrass you. I love you. I love you. I'm committed to you. But if this has been the pattern in your life, then I'm asking you, I don't want you to ask for forgiveness. I want to ask you to allow the Holy Spirit to come in with conviction. And I want you to commit to getting the cow pie off your carpet. In the name of Jesus, to hate evil. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, I just want you to slip up your hand and say, Pastor, I get it. I get it, and it's my time. Just show me. I get it, and it's my time. I'm done. I'm done. I'm not going to ask forgiveness anymore. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get this thing out. Thank you for your honesty, you guys. This is between you and God. God knows and he loves you. And remember, it's not you that he hates. It's the sin that's killing you. Jesus, I thank you for every one of these, many, many in this room that lifted up their hands. I'm not going to point them out or drag them out. Lord, I just want you, by the conviction of your Holy Spirit, to come upon each one of these dear ones who's been honest enough to raise their hand Martin or John Wesley called the Holy Spirit the hound of heaven who comes in and deals with our heart and brings this stuff to the surface so that we can get clean and free and delivered and whole. But it starts with a hatred of the sin that's killing me. 
And so, oh God, by your spirit, I pray that this week would be the week of, of these dear ones' deliverance, oh God. It doesn't happen in a moment, God. Godly sorrow takes time. And I pray right now that your Holy Spirit would begin to work. And every time they go to ask for forgiveness one more time, because you're a loving God and you always forgive, that we stop and we hate evil. We hate it until it changes, until it's gone, until we're clean by the power of the cross. I pray, God, that this would be a week of incredible, deep, cleansing work in our hearts and in our lives. Jesus, you want to pour out your spirit. You want to do revival in this place and in this community. And it starts with the house of God. And so, Lord, bring it on. Bring it to us, O oh Lord, and set us free. Because there's a world out there that's bound in this darkness. It's not your will that your church be bound. And so, God, come and wash away our sins. Let a holy rage rise up inside of us until it's done. In the name of Jesus, I pray. I ask blessing on every house that's represented in this room. I pray, God, that you would just fill our homes with your presence. Fill our minds with the remembrance of this word, that it wouldn't fall on hard, hard ground, but it would find root and it would bear fruit, O oh Lord, in our lives. So we'd walk differently. We'd come in the doors of this church next week completely free. Hallelujah, because now we hate the sin and, and you've dealt with it once and for all. And I thank you for it, God. I thank you for it, God. In Jesus' mighty name, amen, amen. I love you guys. You're awesome. You're good theologians. Thanks for putting up with the... <laughs> Have a great week.